Welcome to the Long Range Pursuit Podcast, presented by Gunworks, where we learn about and share long-range shooting techniques, science, and gear. All right, we're back on with another episode of Long Range Pursuit Podcast, and uh, we've got a pretty exciting, uh, would you call it a launch today, I guess? Probably you've seen some of the news. So new 7 PRC, um, new cartridge. It's been, I think, probably the cat's been out of the bag for a little while if you are actually got your ear to the ground in the industry, uh, but it's official as of today. Hornady gave us the actual go ahead to start talking about it. Uh, we've been playing with this cartridge for a little while now. And obviously we've got a lot of history and background with the 7 LRM having been around for what, Aaron, 15 years, 10 years? Well, we were just talking to, as we were starting yeah, it, 2009 yeah. is when we started forming 375 basic Ruger cases, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, without a shoulder into the 7 LRM. Right. So, you know, I think we've got a lot of questions um, rolling in. So we're trying to get ahead of this and kind of give everybody a little bit of a background, understanding how it compares to some of the other seven millimeter op offerings. Um, you know, should I consider rebarreling or, or building a new rifle in seven PRC or if I've already got a seven LRM or 28 nozzle, how's it going to compare to all these? So a lot to, lot to discuss and dive into. Um, we want to talk a little bit about background and history, or do you want to uh, talk ballistics first? Where you guys want to? Well, go? more so than just about anything that we've done, I I love talking about the seven millimeter. Yeah, I think I think Gunworks single handedly saved the seven millimeter Remington Magnum from extinction. Yeah, like it was that big that big thirty three seventy eight Weatherby run up to long range, you know, flat no holdover type shooting. Mm -hmm. that brought on the 300 rum mm -hmm. and and all the long range guys were that was it it's yeah. like lighter bullets in those cartridges shooting really really fast well i'll tell you i grew up thinking 30 cal is king right and i think a lot of hunters did and i know drinking the kool-aid watching the gun the gunworks videos for years and years is what what converted me yeah. you know the seven rem mag was just absolutely awesome yeah our two top cartridges that we chambered there at the beginning of our our company was the 6524 and the 7 remmeg yeah yeah but I, I was actually doing a little uh preparation for this i was doing some reminiscing the first gun i built gunworks gun this was the prototype like this is the prototype serial gun. number one yeah no 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 like, no. like pre that pre that okay this was a concept build sure it was a Nasika Bay action. It was a high-tech specialty stock. We had to modify quite a bit. And then it was a Lilge barrel. That was the core. Mm. Then we did a Leopold uh, VX3. We did the tall turret on it. And we chambered it in a 7 millimeter. Um, it was a Wildcat based on a 404 Jeffrey case. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a precursor rum type cartridge. Yeah. But it, it was shorter, so it fit better with magazines and bullets seated out you know to the throats and stuff like that so it kind of worked with a long-range bullet and the magazine capacity that we had available there and i took that gun hunting we did some hunting stuff i actually learned a lot hunting with that and using that gun i learned light guns suck heavy recoil sucks you know we we got we were up in adac hunting caribou and i got a shot at a caribou at like 750 yards there were a little bit of fog and took a shot at it without having a great range. Like a rangefinder puked on me. I tried to use the reticle and do the math. Oh yeah. Couldn't see where the bullet landed, mm -hmm. couldn't get reset in the gun to see the impact. So I mean my takeaways from that first early experience was better muzzle brake, a little bit more gun weight, less recoil uh for the cartridge. Mm -hmm. You know, basically you gotta be able to control the gun. And and rangefinders that actually work yeah and look at the trajectory of gunworks from <laughs> that piece yeah. it's like we really really focused on huh. you know the way guns actually shoot and recoil and react but that that cartridge was 3100 feet per second with mm. 180 grain bullet what's that sound like to you guys 20 it's nozzle. right in that that's tw yeah 28 nozzle yeah. class yeah yeah and it, and the gun was sub sub 10 pounds you know, trying to make a lightweight mountain rifle out of it kind of deal. And yeah. it just, it's too light. Mm -hmm. Everything, everything that led to our success came from what we learned from that. 
Yeah. And so then hence the seven REM as our prime cartridge of choice, you know, because available components, because of, you know, recoil, right. et cetera. And we just, we, we crushed it. Like my favorite uh, LRU training slide was the seven REM mag comparison to the 3378. Yeah. And literally you do a chart and you do, everybody was shooting the light Barnes bullets at that time. So you do 168 grain Barnes. Um, I think they were doing triple shocks is what it was at the time. And you do 168 grain burger in the seven. So you had 3,600 feet per second versus 3,000 feet per second. <laughs> and at 600 yards, the bullets were going the same speed. Yeah, right. The Weatherby dropped below the, the 2,000 foot per second threshold at 800 yards. And the Remington Magnum made it all the way to 1,000. And it had 43% less recoil. Yeah. So like you put that slide on the board and you converted every <laughs> single person immediately that is willing to you know, make decisions based on data mm -hmm. and science, they immediately convert it to a seven millimeter. Yeah. And all the guys that bought those LR1000s, you know, those 10, 11 pound guns with chambered in seven rem mag, I talk to those guys all the time and they're like, I wouldn't give up this gun for anything. It kills everything it points at. Yeah, you got all the new fancy, awesome new stocks and everything. And some of those guys, you, you can't pry those old guns yeah. out of their hands. Yeah, you can. Yeah. No, kind of some early reminiscing, but I, I really, really believe in the 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 validity of the seven millimeter as the the long range hunting caliber king. Yeah. So then it just becomes a a matter of arguing about what bullet weight and how fast. Yeah. 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 So going back to those early sevens, you were. Uh, twisting them faster than Sammy Speck, though yeah. obviously. So no, you're gonna get you're gonna get yeah. right to the why. Yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. So we we, we started as a custom gun manufacturer, so we could kind of do whatever we want. We've always been a systems provider. Like we are the guys that provide the gun, the ammo, the optic, the ballistics, everything, mm -hmm. and nobody else really takes on that whole supply chain or vertical integration of that shooting system. So for us, we were able to do, you know, one in nine or one in eight and three quarter twist barrels that would spin up those 168 grain burgers. We would actually shoot some 180s once in a while out of that seven rim mag. But you're right. The twist rate's big. Mm -hmm. It's a big factor. Yeah. So while we say seven rim mag, Technically, customized, right? it Custom was build. customized, yeah. yeah. You know, and the 7 Rem Mag is a fine cartridge, but left alone, it doesn't do quite what you want to do. You know, the factory, the the majority of factory twist weight rates would do the 168 burgers. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you could get away with like a 1 and 9.5, and, and you could find factory guns chambered that way. Because, you know, you had a couple heavy 160 grain bullet options in the in the, in the the stuff. But there. Yeah. I, we got to the point where we just didn't like the belt. Mm -hmm. If you if you did any resizing at all, the belt quickly becomes a pain in the butt. Because yeah. to do a good job of resizing a belt, you have to have a separate sizing die that works that portion just in front of the belt. And then you got to be really careful the way you set it up so that you don't push the shoulders back too much because you work that shoulder a bunch pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you wear your brass out or the brass grows in length. Yeah. that's And that's why we did the 7LRM. It's basically... We like the 7 rem mag. It's awesome. But how can we make this just a little bit more modern? Mm -hmm. And right. I've always been a, a, a history buff when it comes to firearms and weapons. And that stuff got invented 100 years ago. It was Newton's case. He made a whole range of cartridges based on essentially the same case head size. And they were non-belted. And mm. they were freaking cool. Had a gun and everything that went with them, so th so that that there was some early inspiration for some uh, something to look at in the past, you know, to kind of uh, reflect or or to pay homage to in that development. But the real reason was just to get rid of that stupid belt. Yeah, yeah. keep the speed, maybe get just a little bit more, but get rid of that belt. Yeah, there's definitely a difference between keeping something perfectly lined up by grasping it where you need to versus trying to do it. In the rear right of there. a cartridge, you know. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. that design needs to go away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's worked a lot for a long time. It has, and, and it and it does a lot of good stuff. But man, and, I and just your hate your it. chamberings and all of that are far more concentric. But you know, on a grand, you know, commercial mass, size, yeah, the play in many of those just doesn't isn't as conducive for good accuracy. Yeah. So 
So yeah. what were some of your specs? So it was removing the, the belt. You did a 30 degree case shoulder, right? Yeah, we talked, we talked we, early, early on. Um, I got connected with Lonnie Hummel over at Hornady. Mm. And I don't remember what his role was there. He was in uh, tech support, customer service. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so I got hooked up with him and we started talking. Custom dies. Also. Custom dies. Yeah. Yep, back we were day. talking about some custom form dies. I think that's how I got put over to him because I had this concept and we wanted to develop it. We'd made a few prototypes and I, I wanted to actually start making some. And so I, I, I reached out to him at the end of 2009 and started talking to him about it, uh, some custom forming dies. Because what we wanted to do was just do some custom uh, builds for those guys that wanted to do some reloading and, and you know, wanted to, you know, get a really cool rifle system. And so you, you'd have to form that 375 basic. You'd get the, you'd get the non-shouldered version. So it's just straight wall all the way up. And then you'd start forming it down. I can't remember how many dies it was. It was like five or six dies to get the shoulder and the neck established. Mm -hmm. Those are hydraulic form dies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you would actually, you'd size it down, cut the neck off, and then you had that uh, form, that hydraulic form. You'd fill it up with water, and then you'd it, whack the top, yeah, right. and it would form the shoulders up into mm -hmm. the corners. And you could load ammo and shoot it that way without doing a fire form on it. But the biggest pain in the butt that we ran into was the neck size. Yeah. And it was just, it was so heavy and thick right there. We would, in those early LRMs, turn on, we would do neck turning. Mm. So by the time we got done, we had a piece of brass that cost a customer about five bucks. Yeah. So it was a, it was kind of a really small niche, you know, very specific type of customer that we would build those for until we got Hornady spooled up to build brass for us. And then stuff started changing. Yeah. What year would that have been? Another year or so later? I'm thinking I'm thinking brass probably came, so we had that on board of 2010 we were <clears throat> chambering. I I think we started talking about brass early in 2012. So I I think we were spooled up and doing brass by mid to end of 2012. So it came pretty quick. Yeah. We realized yeah. pretty pretty fast it wasn't going anywhere. And you know even the even the spool up to make that brass kind of took we had to modify some chambers a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then we had to, uh, we, we, those early brass lots had some neck variability. We actually made tooling for our CNC machine where we could put a hundred pieces of brass in. You'd put this plate down and kind of hold it. And so all the brass was up there and we would come along and size it down and then expand it. And then we would inside ream. No, we would size it down on the outside. Then we would inside ream huh. with a mill and we would mill the inside of the necks mm -hmm. to get the thickness that we needed. It's a lot of work. Yeah. 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 That brass wasn't cheap yeah. still, but, yeah. but we got all those little details sorted out, you know, probably by 14 or 15. Yeah. And, and that, since that point, the LRM was probably up until maybe three years ago, it was probably our biggest selling seven millimeter. Yeah. yeah. And when it started it was still six, seven years before the 300 PRC even became oh, yeah. commercial. Yeah. Um, there was nothing, well, the 6.5 came out before that, but not, no long actions based on the 3.75 Ruger until that 300 came out on yeah. a commercial basis. Yeah, I think the 28 Nosler came along, and I think human nature just kind of people gravitate to a faster round, right? Not necessarily to their benefit, but that's just kind of what human nature if is. You, if you spend all of your time building guns based on paper, in other words, what you're what you're adding up, or you know what you're calculating on your drop charts, or yeah. whatever. The twenty eight nozzle is pretty badass. Yeah, I get. I I did the same thing. I'm like, you know what? I want to shoot elk farther. Yeah. So we built we built the LRM basically trying to get another hundred feet per second out of the rim mag. We mm. didn't quite get there, but we got a, a an pretty improvement. Close. Yeah. I remember my son's first elk. He was 12. We ran up to our spot up here, up, up the river. And uh, we, it was last day, last weekend, last chance for him to go. And obviously, I don't want to fail. Like, that's, that's not my MO. We get up there in our spot, and we got a pack of wolves in there that had just blown all the elk out of there. Hmm. And only one of us had a tag. It was Brian. 
he couldn't uh-huh. get up the hill fast enough to get one shot. <laughs> Otherwise, we would have had a wolf killed. Uh-huh. But we saw some elk way up at the top of the mountain on the other side of the valley. And we moved all the way down as close as we could get on the ridge we were on. And the, the G7 rangefinder could could only do ballistics out to 1,400. Mm-hmm. So we had we got 1,300 and like 76 yards, I think is what it was. We got the dope on him, and uh, my son shot him with a you know seven rim mag at that distance. But it, you know, we were way past that terminal velocity. So any, anytime you know we've got a number that I say, hey, here's the number that we kind of recommend. You know, I didn't make that up. We have <laughs> You've real tested. data. Yeah. But those bullets just don't expand. You know, when they're sixteen hundred feet per second impact velocity, the, like a bird or like a hollow point. Mm-hmm. But we we got him killed. Got him a good shoulder shot, and it broke him down. And we got, we got up there and and uh, recovered him nice. But but I always had this. Okay, well, what if there's an elk at twelve hundred yards? On paper, the seven rem mag doesn't do it. In my experience, seven rem mag's just a little light. You know, wind dope. Mm. Uh, impact velocity etc yeah. and so we we wanted to push those 180s want to run a little faster and so i got sucked into that 28 nozzler deal yeah you know i did it and i shot it for a couple of years and I, I hated it you just you don't in a hunting weight rifle the rifles that we want to carry and handle and hunt with they're eight to nine and a half pounds ten pounds you know less than eight you're in these ultralights you know over 10 it's a boat anchor yeah so you get this nine pound gun put together and you put a 28 nozzler in it. It's like, it's too much. You, you, as a shooter, you cannot control that gun as well. It, the, the recoil impulse is faster. So it's a little bit more sensitive to, mm. you know, the way that your, your position is all that stuff. And so I, I pulled back from it and came back to the seven LRM. I, I just have not been able to use the 28 nozzler successfully. Yeah, comfortably and and in the field. Mm-hmm. If you even look, um, we've kind of gravitated towards in our own loading, loading that twenty eight down a little bit, a lot closer to what you see the the LRM being capable of. I think you know. So you you, you got a lot of hand loaders out there that are pushing that twenty eight a lot. Harder, I don't. I don't know. I don't are. know that we're necessarily loading it down. I think you see some variability when we switch to our gunworks barrels. You know, we run a a straight up Sammy spec cross sectional area. Mm-hmm. And if you look, our our barrels are running forty, probably forty to fifty feet per second slower than the barrels that we were running before. Okay. And they had this really, really wide groove, hmm. which had a shallower land. And so you ended up with this area that was bigger than a Sammy. And you could run faster in them. Yeah. But what we found with our rifling profile and design was just way more consistent on precision mm. and speeds and and the change in speed over time yeah. was less so we felt like it's it's a little bit of a sacrifice early but the performance we get over time with the consistency is better oh, ways so I, I don't think that we're necessarily loading it down but <clears throat> but we are running a little bit slower gotcha gotcha so how does that 7 LRM then tie in with the 7 PRC? Well, well, I mean, obviously, we've been joined at the hip with Hornady for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, even way before, you know, they sponsored our program and we started working on a bunch of developments with them. I mean, you go all the way back to that 7 LRM development. I mean, that that that's where I met Lonnie right off the bat and then quickly got introduced to Dave and Mitch Middlestead, and then Joe Thielen, mm. and got introduced to all those guys. And we started just scheming about all these projects. And and I kind of pushed hard to get a bunch of these done. And really, you know, Dave was the right person to connect with because he had some pretty big wins in his career mm-hmm. of developing some cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's, he's kind of an old opinion. He's, I, I was going to say grouchy, but he's not grouchy opinionated Mm -hmm. but it it comes from it's founded it's a lifetime of being exposed to everything and in our and i think you can get really cynical in our space because of you know all the hype that comes around new stuff and if you if you're if you're grounded at all you realize how much bull crap you know the the hype is yeah and so i think that's where where i say a little you know opinionated or slightly cynical but but Dave was the perfect guy for me to rub shoulders with because 
we we got excited about the same things. We st- we started scheming about how to get a long range bullet done, and we pushed hard. And I think Dave had to play some major politics and lobby really really hard to make it happen. Mm-hmm. But that's where that long range bullet came from. The whole Doppler radar program, the genesis of the Ford off. So program. much was learned through and, that process. Yeah, everything that cascaded from that thing. Yeah. And that that came from Dave. Mm-hmm. You know, he's thought he's kind of like the granddaddy of a bunch of cool stuff that's happened in our space. That's one yes. of them. And as as much fun as everybody wants to poke at the 6.5 Creedmoor, that's another that's one. That's him. Yeah. yeah. That thing was money. Yeah. Yeah. There's arguably no other cartridge that's come close to it for commercial success in the yeah. last hundred years. And it gets accused of so much marketing drivel, but this was a hardcore project Dave created that, you know, while you guys were working on, say, the, the, the core long range customer that we have now from your side about educating them on things, think of what the Creedmoor did from the other side, just learning, hey, this is a lighter, smaller, whatever cartridge, but it outperforms, outperforms all these and, giants. Yeah. And people started to yeah it get did it. it did to the 308 Winchester yeah what our push into the seven millimeter space did to, did the, to the big magnums yeah, absolutely yeah. yeah made them obsolete no anyways so I got hooked up with Dave over there and we started <laughs> scheming about all sorts of stuff so I remember I was actually reviewing some of my emails and notes and I had sent him it, let's see it was uh, it was the end of May in. It was, this is a funny story. It was the 6.5. It was about the 6.5. We were making a 6.5 short long range Magnum where we took our 7 LRM and we made that same case size fit in a standard short action magazine and shooting 140s, trying to push them up to 3000 feet per second. I thought it was the, I thought it was the coolest freaking invention that we'd ever made. Right. And I emailed Dave in, uh, in May, I think it was 2014. Nope, it was March. It was March of 2015. So I sent him this email and said, Dave, check this out. This is what I'm doing. Here's all the specs. Here's the yeah. results that we're getting. He sends me back an email the next day. He says, well, that's kind of interesting. Look at what we've been doing. And uh-huh. he sent me the print and the specs and the results. That So that that was the uh, 6.5 PRC, you know, way back. Yeah. And at that time, it was called the 264 RCM. Yes. Right? Yeah. That was before any PRC cartridges were yeah. launched. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but so we we were on the same wavelength, um, you know, Dave and I on, mm-hmm. on a lot of stuff there. But um, we we did realize the limits of this the seven LRM as a proprietary cartridge, and I, I had no interest at all in trying to hold something like that tight because if we you can take that thing and make it commercialized, yeah then now everybody can participate and mm-hmm. you're going to get a lot more buy-in and everybody benefits. So in my, in my opinion, I've always wanted to see the seven LRM cartridge make it to the big show. So what was the hangout for the LRM being becoming Sammy spec? Was there one? Well, specific? uh, let's, t- let's talk, let's tell a story about the six, five, um, two eighty four. Okay. Six, five, two eighty four was awesome. Yeah. I got serial number one out there on the front mm-hmm. on the display first, you know, Gunworks, you know, production rifle built. Yeah. Serial number one, six five two eighty four. It's awesome. We made so many of those. I, I again, I believe that we made that a very popular cartridge in this hunting space. Mm-hmm. And again, it led to the acceptance of the six five PRC because that's yeah. just a, a commercialized standardized version. Version, mm-hmm. different cartridge sizes, but it's the same speed, same performance. But why didn't somebody just go? chamber the 65284 as a sammy cartridge neil what's your what's your response well there was too many versions out there that was one of the problems you know so many wildcats for so many years there was hesitancy on the part of sammy to say yeah let's just adopt one and go with it and mm. all these guns are i out mean there. T- t- so versions you got the 65284 <laughs> norma yeah. mm-hmm. you got the 65284 Lapua or well, small base or whatever, yeah, or or the original 284 Win, Winchester yeah. neck down. And so, so you ended yep. up with these uh, uh, base diameters mm-hmm. that were vastly different okay. based on where the parent brass came from. Mm-hmm. So that was problem number one. Problem number two was throats. What's it throated for? 
Hmm. And the and so when you say you have all these versions, basically the problem is okay. So they make a Sammy standardized version of the six five two eighty four, and say this is what we're going to adopt. And let's say it's it's this long, right? So promise you, there is a guy that's going to take a factory round off the shelf, and he's going to put it in his custom gun or his wildcat mm -hmm. gun and it's going to be too short and he's going to close the bolt it's going to blow a primer it's going to take out his eye because mm -hmm. he wasn't wearing safety glasses and mm -hmm. it's going to be the ammo manufacturer's fault that's why nobody would commercialize you know you know make sammy a 65284 huh. so and that's why everybody's pretty cautious about making that mainstream well the same exact scenario happens in a 7LRM okay like we had, we even us controlling everything. We have two versions of that. That early version where we were making brass and turning necks, that's a slightly different chamber than what we created, you know, when we brought the Hornady brass up. Gotcha. And so all those early ones need turned brass, hmm. you know, turned necks. And again, talk about a blow up situation. If you stuffed a factory cartridge in there, you know, potentially that could be in a bigger neck size with a loaded round in it, you'd have a problem. So that that's why you can't just take something that has wildcat success and convert it over to gotcha. um, a factory situation. Gotcha. To add to that, of course, Hornady, you know, analyzed everything for commercial viability and all that, not just in the custom gun making build space. And obviously there is um, some desire to keep it at a standard magnum length too. So the 300 PRC was a stretch. 3.7 inches is really long. I mean, we all know the story on that. It took gun builders to do different things with magazines. Well, 3.7 inches on the 7 would be crazy long. In fact, that'd be even longer than need be for the for the 7 millimeter bullets that are out there. Um, the 28, sorry, the 7 LRM is a straight neck down of the 300 or the 375 overall length case, right? Shoulders push back. Shoulders push back yep. a little bit. Yep. But I think what, what they went for there was really they could get the same ballistics and shorten it just enough to fit in that 3.34 inch uh standard long um long action magazine and and still be able to hit their target so yeah um it makes so a lot of sense the, my lrm case had a neck length that was 1.5 ish of the caliber and the prc formula is a lot more like one caliber length gotcha on the neck so we had a longer neck Mm -hmm. um, our throat that we made in the 7LRM was made specifically for the 180 Burger Hybrid. And so that throat is short. The freebore is is almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. So we got a really long neck. We've got a really short freebore. And if you go try to load, say, like the 180 grain Hornady uh, match bullet with a secant ogive, you're stuffing it way down into the case to make it fit in our standard chamber. So again, I think with the seven PRC, what you what we see is this standardization at this three point three four overall loaded length. Now that's the tip of the bullet, and the goal there is that you load them to that length maximum for Sammy spec ammo, mm -hmm. so that it fits in the traditionally shorter long action magazine yeah. length. Mm -hmm. So that would be like the Brownings and the Winchesters, and you know any most of the things that aren't the uh, I think the uh, Remington base is just a little bit longer, but all those other ones are just a little bit shorter. So that kind of covers a really broad range of interchangeability. And at the same time, you know, what, what we're always looking for in our long range cartridges, let's not stuff the bullets into the case. Let's load them out so that we get full case value. Right. Yep. And then we've got these really, really long bullets. So throating it a little bit longer, um, making room for those, the PRC does a pretty good job of accommodating those. I'll tell you what, though, when I was, uh, I built a gun uh, this spring to go to Africa. You know, Hornady sent over a care package with some brass, uh, you know, some chamber reamers, some no-go gauges, et cetera. So we chambered up uh, one of our new Nexus rifles, and I took it over to Africa. But I got stuck doing load development. Everybody was busy making guns, mm -hmm. and I haven't had to do that for a couple of years. But it was not compatible with a hybrid ogive number one. And number two is I don't know that the short 160 grain 
168 grain bullets are going to work. Hmm. So that I I almost I almost feel like the new PRC chambers are antithetical to hybrid ogives because you can't get anywhere near close to seating because mm -hmm. the bullets are out of the case. Yeah, uh, I did I did some. Uh, first loading with the 195 EOL bullet from Ber Berger. And I found some pretty good reasonable velocities in the mid-27s, I think, mm. if I remember correctly, shooting really good groups. Yeah. Um, I ended up settling on a on a 180-grain match load that was that was pretty hot, somewhere in that 20, 28, I think I was like 28, 80, 28, 75 on a 20-inch 20 20 barrel. 20-inch, yeah. Mm. And it was, that was my hand loads I settled on. I think the uh, they shipped us a, a couple cases of ammo loaded, some mm -hmm. pre-production ammo, and I'm I think my data was twenty eight forty for that same uh, barrel combination. So just a little bit slower than what I'd loaded up, which makes sense. I think you get into that sixty five thousand psi. That's pretty hot. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know when you're loading for factory stuff, you always kind of pull. A, couple thousand psi out of that so that makes sense to me hmm. but i like it that gun's done well for us this year we've killed a lot of animals with it and uh for me i don't feel any significant difference between that setup and the 7lrm i've been shooting i mean as far as case capacity as far as uh velocity potentials with bullets twist rates i mean it's they're essentially ballistically identical right slightly different yeah you look design. at the 7 lrm i think the shoulder maybe is a hundred thousandths forward so a little bit longer okay so what that should tell everybody that's got a 7 lrm is you're not going to stick a 7 prc reamer in there and clean it up which is i think a question a lot of guys have yeah you, you have to set a barrel back yeah which you might as well just shoot the barrel out and just put it Give in the barrel, barrel. yeah i think the i think the neck like the mouth of the case neck is almost a quarter inch shorter yeah i mean visually you set the two side by side you know and, and we'll, we'll post some pictures out yeah. there but i mean it's it's visually but shorter, if you right? but if you flip if you flip it and look at how much longer the throat is yeah i i, I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't have more usable case capacity because you're not taking up space inside the case. Interesting. Hmm. In fact, I almost would argue it's got to be dead nuts or just a little bit more than a 7 LRM. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So, I mean, trying to compare apples to apples, kind of what people can expect, you know, 24 inch barrel is pretty standard just as far as like trying to get an across the board comparison. Uh, so you would, it sounds like they're billing it for what twenty nine fifty with a one eighty out of a twenty four inch barrel. It's kind of the a little the more than that. I want to say um, was the one seventy five at three thousand. Yeah, um, and the one eighty at twenty nine seventy five. I believe. Okay, okay. that's what their target velocity is for their factory. Gotcha. Ammo. I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna see it on our barrels right in that twenty nine. You know, thirty to twenty nine fifty. Yeah, yeah. On a twenty four inch. Seems like that's what what we've seen with the testing. Yeah. So, and you would compare that almost identical to the LRM then? Yeah. What we've been getting. That's what that's what we've been running. Yeah. Just, I mean, I guess to compare and contrast a little bit. I mean, the, in comparison, the rem mag, you're probably seeing. Where where would you throw the rem mag? You're in there? you're uh, a little faster than twenty eight fifty. So the the way I was stacked up the LRM was. You're you're all, you're 75 feet per second faster than a rem mag, and you're around 75 to 100 feet per second slower than a no, 28, sorry. right in between. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's that's the way I always characterized about, it. About right. Yeah. Uh, you know, the outside di diameter of that LRM case is the same as if the belted magnum case of the L of the seven rem mag was continued yeah. forward. So there's a little bit to yeah. be gained there um, to offset. And then you know. Maybe on the low end, you got like the seven SOM and the 280 Ackley that'll probably be 100 feet per second slower. You know, the seven SOM's really, really close to a seven rem mag. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we almost duplicate the rem mag. Maybe you give up 10 or 15 feet per second. Right. But it's right there. Right. The biggest problem with a SOM is bullets. Yeah. It's like everybody said, oh, I want short action because that point three inches makes, makes this huge difference, difference on right. how fast I can reload my gun or how light my gun is. But as soon as you go to a short action, now you're limiting your lengths. And so everybody mm -hmm. that's playing, unless you're just doing total custom ammo 
wildcat custom gun stuff which if you know what you're doing fine if you don't it could open Get you yourself up some trouble, some trouble. Yeah. but it, if you uh if you have that short action and you try to load a 180 grain bullet in that seven psalm it's like you give up some speed you do it's a a, just a little bit soft and it's hard to take advantage of the case and still mm-hmm. fit in a in a, the right throat and magazine combination so I, I i really don't think the seven psalm is comparable like it's it's a little bit more in that seven rim mag, and to your point earlier, it's it's kind of obsolete. I mean, we, we chamber and sell a lot of them. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some sex appeal to it, but it is it is not the right cartridge. Yeah. So it's that it's that whole uh, uh, mama bear just right you know yeah. porridge situation right. i think here yeah. not too hot not Goldie too cold locks. yeah yeah we'll you can get more velocity out of the 28 but with it comes tremendous amount more recoil uh share those numbers that you were telling me about this is i actually did i actually called bullshit on this yeah but yeah i, I think uh neil neil convinced me well using a online you know recoil ballistic calculator 10 pound gun uh seven prc at at a modest 29.50 uh, that's going to be roughly a 65 grain charge weight of powder is going to give you 23.24 pounds of recoil. You go up to a modest 28 nozzler at 3050, so 100, 100 foot per second gain of velocity, but you're using 82 grains of powder to achieve that. So you got more powder there, and you're going to, you're going to go up 25 percent to 29.12 pounds see and that's lining up exactly with this uh we, we did a little get some infographic a little comparison of seven millimeters yeah. a couple years back and maybe we'll do a revision there and pull the the seven prc yeah. in but yeah that's lining well, up. what's crazy is the guys who are really stomping on the 28 so you can you can shoot that same 180 grain bullet another 100 feet per second faster so 3150 and some guys are you know obviously pushing it further than that but that's uh upwards of 90 to 95 grains of powder 95 mm-hmm. grains of powder that's 48 percent increase over that original 7 lrm load yeah well that backs up exactly what i was talking about why i moved away from the 28 as my favorite mm-hmm. cartridge yeah because you just lose control of the gun you and do. and most people most people get into this uh well, I'm tough. I can take the recoil. It does recoil doesn't bother recoil, me, yeah. Yeah. right? You hear it a thousand times, but the problem is if you if you study the dynamics of a rifle and you put up you put the ten pound gun or better yet, what everybody wants to buy is an eight to eight and a half pound gun. You put an eight and a half pound gun down and you put a heavy recoil situation together, the gun actually moves more before the bullet exits, which means the gun accelerates faster in a rearward fashion, and with and if you look at what it takes to shoot a gun consistently and produce good accuracy and precision as well, but accuracy, it's the ability for that gun to kind of forgive, you know, some of your inconsistencies in the way that you grip or the pressure that you put on. And the faster that gun recoils, Mm -hmm. the more it moves and the more consistent you have to be, you know, shot to shot to shot. Mm -hmm. And from a hunting perspective where you're not always just in this perfect you know, prone, flat, lots of time, you know, get behind the gun routine where you might have to just throw down and shoot. And if, and if in that scenario, that extra recoil, that faster rearward recoil makes that gun a little more sensitive. And now you push, you know, half to three quarter MOA on your point of impact at 850 yards. And if you stack up a couple other errors that already put you in a bad situation, Mm -hmm. that's the difference between a hit or a miss. That and follow that up with as a shooter if i can see where the bullet hits i can have another round in the chamber and probably fired before the spotter's been able to process what he saw and communicate it to me so again making me more successful in the field Mm -hmm. by not disturbing my sight picture absolutely you know that's why we do muzzle brakes the way we do it's why we do stock design the way we do Mm. and it's why we pick the cartridges that we do Mm. This applies perfectly down to a five and a half pound 280 Ackley, you know, yeah. you can have the same experience. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Just, just to throw this in there and why we push a lot of guys even down to a six, five versus a seven, your six, five PRC is literally half the recoil energy. So if you can get away with a six, five, that's why we push a lot of guys down on, on calendar. Well, it's why yeah. everybody says they love their six fives. Yeah. 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 Cause yeah. they shoot them so much right. better. And even going back to the 28, what are you really gaining 
for for all of that extra recoil and all that. You well, know? if you're pushing the boundaries, and this is what got me there in the first time, mm-hmm. is I I feel very strongly that you have to have enough impact velocity to get the bullet to expand. Not a lot, yep. just something. You know, the main reason is because if the bullet expands, you get a, a shoulder stabilized penetration, which means straight through. Yep. If the bullet doesn't expand, it's... then it tumbles and you mm-hmm. can J-hook. Sometimes it'll go through, mm-hmm. but I've actually seen a bullet steer out the same side of an elk. A bullet that didn't expand, an, an old Barnes triple shock. Goes in, comes out the same side. Ooh. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy stuff. I'm convinced that some amount of expansion allows that bullet to uh, stabilize uh, on the shoulder, which means it transitions from like a spin stabilized projectile to a shoulder stabilization that, mm. that allows it to penetrate straight through. Sure. It's the same reason you build those big game bullets or the old Keith bullets in the 44 with the wide knee plat because that creates a shoulder stabilization. The second application there is that shoulder or that face, that flat face, it displaces tissue yeah. Right. And so that that hydrodynamic damage, that tissue displacement damage that happens in the wound cavity actually makes a lot more damage than the bullet itself makes. I think that's what a lot of guys are thinking when they talk knockdown. Right. I mean, their knockdown is not not scientific, but they're trying to to translate what they're seeing in reality. Knockdown right? is a bullshit term. Right. Right. But that that more dynamic expansion i think yeah. is creating if you if you good... get that little bit of expansion it'll go straight through and it'll make a bigger wound cavity than just the bullet yeah sure so that's why that in imp- that impact velocity is what essentially drives that expansion that mm-hmm. and the bullet design so like a like a tipped bullet design that tip is a is a really soft material it disintegrates quickly so you end up with this flat nose shape which accepts more work from the impact mm-hmm. of the bullet Whereas a real pointy bullet tip that's copper, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot stronger. So it takes a little bit more definitely to make that tip fail. And and I I would even propose most of the time it starts tumbling and the bullet just breaks in mm-hmm. half and then it expands at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then you have a like a plastic tip. That tip will fail and it'll expand. So if you different bullets require different speeds. But my my number for a VLD style bullet like a copper tip, Motel Hall Point, you got to have two thousand feet per second yeah you get into a tipped bullet you know i think you can drop down into that 1800 number Mm -hmm. so so somewhere in that 1800 to 2000 feet per second is the impact velocity that you need so if you take that as a threshold and say okay well what cartridge bullet combination is going to get me the farthest because i need to be able to kill elk at 1200 because i promise you i'm going to see a 375 bull up there (laughs) and it's going to be 1200 yards away and i'm going to need to shoot at it so that that 1200 yard was my goal and that's what got me to the 28 is I could get just a, another 100 maybe 150 yards mm-hmm. of yeah. effective terminal range. Well, that was the point I wanted to get. I agree 100% on the the need for the extra velocity terminally. But when you're looking at a possible 48% increase in recoil, you're buying yourself really only 150 to 200 yards yeah. at distance sometimes it's key but so it's, it's why not i came rep- back it's why it's i came back for i came back because it was the juice wasn't worth the squeeze yeah yeah and what i did was i, I switched to a tipped bullet instead of that vld style mm-hmm. and that tipped bullet gives me that extra 200 yeah. feet yes. per second you can of go down to 1600 on some of the the good bullets yeah those are pushing pushing but, it but yeah well, and not to mention so many of these guys that are never going to take a shot past a, a thousand yards or past mm-hmm. 800 or wherever they're limiting, limiting themselves, these these extra large magnums. Now you're getting all of that negativity without any with of the no real benefit. benefit. Yeah. Right? No, nothing yeah. you need. Like the other, the other one I was going to say is wind. Mm-hmm. Anything you can do to reduce your wind deflection has value yeah. because none of us are perfect at guessing wind. Sure, sure. So that's the second. Th- those are the yeah. two factors I use when I evaluate a cartridge. Yeah. It might be more fun if we have Dave here where you guys can uh, go back and forth, but the idea that any doubling of velocity, you get quadruple the drag against it. Yeah. To me, just speaks so much why it's mm. so hard to get significant gains by simply adding more powder. Yeah. It's, it's well, not, not only that, but here's, an, here's another piece that I, a lot of people maybe don't realize or don't factor in. So we've gone through this We've gone through a lot of different things at our company. I mean, we've technically, 
I started this in 2005. We incorporated in 2006. Mm -hmm. 2005, that's 18 years. Yeah. And I was into I was into bullets and shooting and stuff well before that. You know, uh, studied as an engineer, so kind of got into this at college from a technical side. And and I'm a voracious reader. I love stories, and I love uh, the guys that have come before and the work that they've done, and trying to understand like where they ended. And maybe pick up from that point so you don't rehash the same stupid mistakes that a lot of people make. Mm. But I, I, I really feel like the there is there's some dynamic structural limitations that bullets have. Um, what my favorite my favorite thing was my knee jerk reaction was working with Dave when he was doing the Doppler stuff was he started showing us how much better the BCs were when you spun the bullets faster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and first of all, I've always been a BC guy. So it's like, I started knocking guys that weren't running high BC bullets, but they were running heavy recoil 30s a yeah. long time ago. So here I'm sitting, it's all about BC, run a bigger BC. And then then you get old, um, um, uh, you get these really, really stupid heavy for caliber bullets and you put them in there and you actually do an analysis and you don't get as good of performance at say a thousand yards. Mm -hmm. But we put everybody on this BC momentum train, and so they're all on it. And it's like, oh, if the bullet has a better BC, then it's better. They, and they're not calculating the cost of velocity mm -hmm. and and the limitations that yep. you get and the, the you introduce with the longer bearing surface and the higher pressures. So it's basically this velocity cost where like 195 grain in most of these smaller sevens does not perform the best. And so there's this optimum bullet weight for your cartridge. So when Dave introduces this idea that all you have to do is change the twist rate on the barrel from a nine inch twist on a seven to a seven and a half inch twist, and you can increase your BC almost 20%, I jumped on that bandwagon real quick mm -hmm. and started doing real fast twist, you know, seven millimeter stuff. And we didn't go that extreme on our sevens, but we did drop down to an eight for, for production guns. So we have a couple years of eight inch twist barrels on sevens. Mm. You push the a a bullet like you want to you want a bullet that shoots a tight group. It's not going to be a bonded bullet. Hmm. It's not going to be an A frame or or partition style yeah. bullet. It's not going to you know. So you you want a tight group. You're going to end up with this bullet that's really really simple, mm -hmm. which means copper jacket lead core, very concentric. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, target bullet, whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah. So. And now you share quotes, right? Yep. The guys are listening. Yep. So now you shoot a now you <laughs> yeah. shoot a, um, a a very precise bullet that also has very long range potential for accuracy. You know, low BC variation. Um, you know, stable, stable. You know, way mm -hmm. out to that transonic uh, region. So you've got this this bullet that's that's target bullet, and now you run a seven and a half inch twist. And now you Still think, well, let's just up. double up and make it really good. <laughs> Put it in front of a 28 nozzle. Now you're running 30, 50, 30, 100 feet per second. Guess what happens to those bullets? Smokes them. A bit much. Literally yesterday so, I experienced that. Most yeah. people don't understand how fast a bullet's spinning as it comes up. by Yeah, the RPMs are 300,000 yeah. plus thousand RPM. Yeah. So you've got this really, really fast speed. And what happens, those bullets just can't hold together. Mm -hmm. And they literally come apart. And so you hit this limit of, well, how fast can we push it and how fast can we twist it and how heavy can it be? How good can the BC be? You know, what's the corresponding velocity? So there's, there's this concept of the sweet spot. Yeah. And again, the 7LRM, okay, now the 7PRC, the 7PRC is in the sweet spot. So all of my experience, hundreds, hundreds of hunting experiences and decades of training experiences with thousands of customers and our whole company, you know, tens of thousands of rifles produced for customers. Like the seven PRC is the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Back on the fast twist thing, obviously over the years, you've seen many, many bullets. You've seen how good they can be and how sometimes not as good they are, but obviously the faster you twist them, any inherent flaw in the bullet making is magnified as yeah. well. 
So if they're not concentric for any reason, you're going to see a whole lot worse out of a fast twist than a you'll regular see, twist. You'll see you can slip a, a core inside of a jacket and totally screw up the way that bullet flies without blowing it up. Hmm. So you can you can get poor performance without actually blowing a bullet up. So again, that that just right, the speed, mm -hmm. the twist rate, you know, the velocities, everything optimized for the the magazines that we have and the receivers that we shoot i'm i'm very excited about the prc in fact i think it in my opinion it probably kills the 7rlm will probably migrate pretty heavily that way it'll take some time though i mean you know brass ammo you know getting the pipeline filled up yep you know making guns available yeah so maybe let's jump into a couple questions that people have got um you know, and kind of where, how that we see that implementation going. It sounds like I think we've got some rifles built, ready to go. Is that? Yeah, I think we turned loose some uh, some Magnus builds, and uh, obviously our new Nexus, the soon to be released for for yeah. production Nexus. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll do that one in seven PRC. So the Nexus will feature the PRC lineup, the six five seven and three hundred PRC. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal being. Uh, very compatible with a uh, factory available ammunition so right. that we can keep ammunition costs lower, um, availability higher, et cetera. Uh, in our fully custom guns on the Magnus side, you know, we've got a, uh, we've got kind of a pre call it a launch, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, pro build that we've put right. together that has uh, seven PRC. But in this case, we are, we're setting it up for Hornady factory ammunition. It'll be kind of a limited, um, offering there. Generally, our full custom guns feature Gunworks ammunition. Yeah. And that will probably come later down the road. Yeah. Just need to fill up the pipeline with some brass and a few things. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, all the guys sitting there thinking, man, I've got a 7 Rem mag, I've got a 28 Nozzler, I've got a 7 LRM. So, what's what's the answer? Everybody's asking, should I Well, should I if it's a Gunworks not? rifle, then it's fine. You'll kill lots of stuff with it. If it's somebody else's gun, <laughs> then obviously dump it and get a new gun works in a 7 right. PRC. Yeah. Shameless plug. <laughs> no, the 7 Rem Mag, 7 LRM, 7 SOM, 7 PRC, the differences are paper differences. Yeah. Like they're very small differences. And unless you're pushing past that half mile on terminal, like you can shoot targets all you want at 1,200, 13, 1,400 yards. But if you're pushing past that half mile on terminal effective range, you know, 880 yards, you need to start really paying attention to what you're delivering downrange for impact velocity. Yeah. yeah. So other than that, I would say there's really no sense in making a change. Yeah. You know, if you get to the point where you you use up a barrel, you know, take a look at a uh, new chambering. Yeah. But if, if that's not the situation, you've got a lot of life left, I'd say keep shooting it. Seems like, uh, you know, when the 300 PRC came out, a lot of guys asking, you know, 300 win, 300 PRC. And I, I think that was kind of my answer to most <clears throat> guys was, you know, if you're shooting a 300 win, I wouldn't change. But if you're looking at buying a new rifle and it's this or that, then I think the 300 PRC is a really viable choice. I think if you got a 28 Nozzler, in my opinion, you if you make a change, yeah. you will get a benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, that's my opinion, though. A lot of people are different, and we've sold so many 28s, and so many customers are so happy yeah. with them. I'm not saying everybody should run out and change, but I'm telling you, you will receive a benefit as a shooter and mm -hmm. hunter in you know, better performance, kind of from the shooting side of it, better right. delivery of bullets to target, mm -hmm. you know, better follow-up, better follow-through, all of those things uh, as a hunter and shooter. Yeah. But gunworks rifles aren't cheap. So it needs to be a deliberate and, and purposeful choice there. Yeah. So do you see us uh, continuing to chamber seven LRMs or is, is that? Yeah, I, I'll cut? bet there's probably a year crossover, but my forecast says within the next year, we won't chamber LRM anymore. Just, just retired, maybe. Con yeah, continue totally supporting supported it on with the brass side. and ammunition mm -hmm. and, and all that but, but essentially eventually convert over to the yeah. lrm or prc as well the, think about it why why do something that's just a little bit different than this should be widespread yeah. widely adopted widely available ammo mm -hmm. yeah why why produce more guns like that i i, I firmly 
firmly believe in providing value to the customer. Mm -hmm. And to me, I don't see what that value is. So to yeah. me, that, that means it's dead. Yeah, it makes sense. Functionally identical. Yeah. Just better support for the 7 PRC with. Yeah, right now we have kick butt brass for the 7 LRM and they shoot good and they work good. We can't say the same thing for the PRC. We, I bet it takes us months and months to get a, a shipment of brass from Hornady on the PRC. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, I have no idea how long that could take. So it, it that could be a challenge for us. So that's why I say there's a year crossover. There's there a year is. where we're able to support the LRM yeah. maybe better than the PRC. Sure. Yeah. But after some point, um, it's going to be PRC all the way. Yeah. So right now, the Hornady factory ammo, it will be out there. They have some made. They're making more right now. They just uh, told us this week. So there will be some out there, but I think a lot of it's going to come first quarter of next year. Yeah. Maybe. Ammo in general right now is so yeah, tough, right? Absolutely. But, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was uh, basically the, the worst kept secret in the uh, industry for many, many years. You know, when we launched the 300 PRC went back in my Hornady days, almost everybody was like, I thought you were going to do a seven. I thought you were going to do seven. We want a seven. <laughs> we want a seven. And for years, our standard answer was, well, we've created one. We're just waiting on the timing to be right. Because mm -hmm. for a while there, it just wasn't right. We couldn't make enough of what we were already making. And then with the uh, the last election, it just got worse. So uh, obviously now they're they're finally able to do this commercial cartridge. But uh, yeah, we've been telling people about it for years. So I, th I think there's a number of people that are looking forward to the PRC. And I'm anxious to see yeah, what it I does. Hope, I hope everybody doesn't knock it for not being a bigger cartridge. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, the, the beauty of the PRC is that it's just right. To try to be the 28 Nosler, it would have came up short. You, you, maybe it would have been throated a little better. But it wouldn't it wouldn't have been as great a cartridge. Yeah. And and mm -hmm. my prediction is this is going to be one of the all time greatest cartridges for you know the very specific you know precision rifle shooting long range hunting yeah. crowd. Yeah, yeah, it, it's perfect. Yeah, I think you know just the little bit of rumblings I've seen. I think a lot of people are either uh, disappointed that it's not a short action like the 6.5 was, right. or that it's not super fast like the 28 was. And, you know, everybody's got their own preferences and, and but if ideas. You have, but if you have like all the you knowledge, that, if that, you understand, you have to fit this bullet yeah. with this throat, yeah. you know, with this powder capacity to get these speeds. Not everybody's a hand loader and doesn't care if it's safe or not, yeah. mm -hmm. right? You, you load something 75, 80,000 PSI, it's like, ooh, it goes fast, but so what? It's like nobody that builds guns or ammunition gets to do that. Yeah. yeah. You get yeah. 60, 61,000 PSI. That's it. So what can you do with that pressure, mm -hmm. you know, with the bullets that we want to shoot, it's not going to fit in a short action. That's just stupid. Yeah. yeah. And to try to take a 300 PRC and just neck it down and try to get another 100 feet per second out of it, it's like it's going to maybe duplicate what a 28 Nosler is, but guess what? It's going to have all the Same baggage, yeah. right? You're going to have the bullet spin rate issues. You're going to have the recoil issues. And, and then, like you said at the very beginning, it's not going to be as compatible with many as many guns, which means it, it won't be as widely adopted, which means we won't have as many choices for ammo mm -hmm. or rifles. So, yeah. again, I think it's just right. What the 7 Rem Mag should have been. Basically, yeah. 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 Well, cool. thanks for jumping on, guys. I think we pretty much covered it all. So, oh, there's always more. Yeah, and we'll probably be doing some follow-ups. But I think the takeaway is uh, is just like you said. It's it's the just right solution, not not the super hot. It's not the you know it it is what it is for a reason. And I think, I think we gonna... could build our whole business off of six five Creedmoor, six five PRC, seven PRC, and three hundred PRC. Yeah, it's like there's literally no other added value to any of the other cartridges right everybody get, feels that there's cartridge magic but there's not but yeah and we'll and we'll continue to support a lot of cartridges right. but i'm all in on that group that's mm -hmm. a good group of cartridges and the funny thing is it's all got a little dave emery heritage in it doesn't it yes it yeah. does cool well congratulations to the horny guys for launching a needed a needed uh cartridge in this space as much as people say they don't need another seven this was needed for the factory twist rates throat lengths and fitments in chambers now all of a sudden we're going to have 
out of the box factory guns kicking butt all over the place. Yeah. It's awesome. It's better for the sport. It's better for us. Absolutely. Thank you. The guys at home, check it out on gunworks.com. Give us a call. Uh, we're building them and got a few ready to go if you hurry. So probably not. Probably not. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> They're Whatever. probably already gone. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> If you like what you're hearing here, please take a second and give us a five-star rating and a positive review on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. We appreciate your feedback and suggestions for topics you'd like discussed or questions you want answered on the podcast. You can reach out on Facebook or Instagram or send us an email to podcast at gunworks.com. Also, be sure and check out our full offering of long-range gear at gunworks.com. Use promo code LRP for free shipping on any order.